Hello and welcome to the Hill Country Memorial Restore Pre-Op Joint Education class. My name is Kelly Schneider. I'm the Restore Program Coordinator. And in this class, you will be educated about what to expect before, during, and after a total hip and a total knee replacement surgery. This book goes along with your guidebook. This is just the way to get the most updated information as we do change things with Restore quite frequently. The second slide you'll see, this is just a little bit of our brag page. This page shows some of the awards and certifications that stand behind the hospital and Restore. The ones that are real important to Restore are the gold seal that you see there in the middle of the screen. That is the Joint Commission Gold Seal of Approval. This gold seal was earned back in 2013 and Restore continues to keep the gold seal. In fact, we just renewed our certification and received that gold seal again in January of 2020 and our Joint Commission gold seal approved for another two years. The award on the far right is another one that's very important to Restore and the Restore team. That is the Bill Aston Quality Award given to us by the Texas Hospital Association. This award was received in February of 2019 as part of Restore's hard work in reducing the use of opioids or pain pills um, with our total joint replacement surgeries. Whether you knew it or not, once you've signed up to have that joint replaced and to be part of Restore, you're now part of the Restore team. The biggest part of the team, of course, is you, the patient. But another really critical role um, of the team, another valuable team player, is that coach. And that coach is that person that you have chosen, whether it's your spouse or a friend, a family member, maybe a child. But that is your, that's your person. That's who's going to be there for you. They'll be there when you have surgery. They will be there when you do your exercise with the therapy team. They'll be your extra set of ears with all the instructions to provide for you as you go home. Your surgeon, we like to give them some credit. They're a pretty amazing group of individuals. They are definitely a huge part of this Restore team. Your primary care doctor, he's the one or she is the one that got you here today. They're the ones that cleared you for surgery and told us that everything is safe and we can proceed. The anesthesia department is huge here at Hill Country Memorial, especially with our total knee replacement patients. We use indwelling pain catheters, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But anesthesia, which is very rare, they actually round on all of our total knee patients every day while you're here. Most of the time with anesthesia, you see them prior to surgery and then you never see them again. So we're really excited to have them such a big part of this team. Orthopedic nurses and nurse aides, they'll be the ones taking care of you while you're here. Physical therapy and occupational therapy, they're huge players in your recovery and your discharge from the hospital. Um, physical therapy, you'll see them about four times a day. Um, occupational therapists will come in and see you the day after surgery and help you out with anything you may need as far as daily living. The pharmacy team is huge here. They make sure that we have all the medications that you take at home, that we can continue to provide that medication for you while you're here in the hospital and also provide anything else that you may need with going home. Case managers are registered nurses here at Hill Country Memorial. Case managers are in charge of getting a plan for you once you leave the hospital. So you'll see them. They will work with you in coming up with a rehab plan. We joke and say you can leave the hospital without having a bowel movement, but you're not leaving the hospital without a rehab plan going home. Home health services are a huge role in our Restore team. Most of our patients, I would say about 85 to 90% of our patients use home health services. And so we will discuss that in great depth towards the end of the presentation as well. So today's objectives in this preoperative class are to understand your procedure, whether you're having a total knee or a total hip. We'll talk about both of those in great detail. What to expect during your hospital stay. We'll talk about the roles of physical and occupational therapy. We'll discuss pain management. We'll talk about how to care for yourself at home. 
And like I said, that coach is really important. So we're going to talk a lot about the roles of the coach throughout the presentation, as well as talking about some discharge planning options. So looking at a knee first. So this picture is a picture of a healthy knee joint. This is not what you have if you're sitting there needing a knee replacement. So the knee joint is made up of a femur, which is your thigh bone, a tibia, which is your shin bone, a patella, which is your kneecap, and then healthy cartilage in the middle and kind of lining on those bones. Well, if you're here for a knee replacement, this is probably what your knee looks like. This is an arthritic knee joint or a diseased knee. So where that healthy cartilage was on the slide before, now that cartilage is diseased. So it's worn away. You'll hear the term bone on bone, and that's exactly what it is. That cushion, that cartilage is worn away, and now you're in pain. You can't sit you can't stand, you can't step, everything is painful, and that's because that nice cushion is now gone. When we talk about replacing the knee, you can think of it more of a resurfacing of the knee joint. Sounds a little bit better that way too. So when they go in to replace the knee, they'll go in through the front of the knee. They will then resurface the femur or the thigh bone They'll resurface the end of that and place a piece of metal that is made of cobalt chrome. That becomes your femoral component. Then they'll transition to the tibia or the shin bone. They'll resurface that area. And so resurfacing means making it clean, making that surface nice and pretty and shiny, taking all the disease away. So they'll resurface that shin bone as well. They'll add in a titanium metal plate with a small stem that goes down into the bone. In between the two pieces of metal, you will have a piece of high polymer plastic. That plastic is guaranteed or is set to last for 25 to 30 years. That keeps the metal from wearing on each other. Most of our patients actually get to keep their kneecap. They just resurface the back of your kneecap and place a plastic button so that that kneecap then glides smoothly over the metal and plastic in the knee. Bone cement is used for both the femoral and tibial components of the knee. It's kind of like quickcrete. It dries really fast. Our total knee replacement patients are up and walking within three hours after surgery. Now transitioning to the hip, if you're, here, if you're attending for a hip replacement, your hip is a little bit different than a knee. So a knee is considered a hinge joint. It just flexes back and forth. A hip, however, is a ball and socket joint. So a hip has the top of, we're now at the top of the femur, the top of the thigh bone. There's a ball um, at the end of that femur bone called the head of the femur. And then on your pelvis, there is a socket or known as the acetabulum. And that is where the head of the femur then inserts into the pelvis is into that socket. Both the ball and the socket are lined with articular cartilage, and just as we talked about in the knee, that articular cartilage is there for protection and for smooth gliding and comfort of those joints. Well, when you have arthritis in your hip, just like in the knee, it becomes diseased, it wears away, it becomes bone on bone. A little different with the hip, most total hip patients come to us pretty quickly. I've heard knees put it off for 25 to 30 years. You know, you hear, oh, I should have had it done a lot sooner. Most of the time a hip, they can have just a small pinhole of wear through the articular cartilage, just the tiniest little hole, and their pain is already very extreme and very intense. And so they'll come to us a little bit sooner to have that hip replaced. So when you're looking at a hip replacement, what they're going to do is they're going to come in on the femur. They're going to remove your head, the ball, off of your femur. They will then put in a rod, a metal rod, down into the femur that has a new head on it or a new ball um, on the top of that femur. Then on your pelvis side in that socket, they're going to clean that out as well and they'll put in a new metal socket. That socket is where your high polymer plastic liner is in, and then the ball and the socket come together. There is a screw up through the acetabular component of the hip, 
but there is no cement used in total hips. Total hips also are up and walking about three hours after the surgery. So the approaches for the total hip, most of our total hips at Hill Country Memorial, if you have Dr. Ramonic or Dr. Biker, for sure, they're going to be doing an anterior total hip. So that anterior approach is an incision in the front of the hip. It doesn't require movement of the major muscle groups, so it's a lot of muscle sparing. Usually the recovery is a lot faster, pain is a little bit less, um, and of course your risk for dislocation is less. It's not gone, but it is less. Another option may be an anterior lateral, lateral approach, that the incision is just moved over to the side of the hip just a little bit more. I'm still sparing quite a few muscles, but maybe just a little bit more pain, a little bit more recovery time, and watching for those precautions just a little bit more. So one of the biggest things we want to do when we're talking about having our joint replaced is we want to be prepared. So being prepared means starting smart. So preparing your home prior to coming to the hospital for surgery. You want to set up your home so that you can move around easily. That means removing any kind of loose flooring, loose throw rugs, carpeting, things like that where your walker can catch on those or could become a tripping hazard. You also want to clear any walking paths in your home, making sure your walker is going to be wider than you are. So make sure that you don't have narrow pathways, wide open spaces, easy to maneuver, so it's better to move furniture now prior to surgery than after you've had it. Another thing we recommend is a chair with armrests, so really important. You're going to have some trouble getting up and down. Sitting in low surfaces is going to be difficult for both hips and knees. So having a chair that has some good armrests on it so that you can push up with your arms to get up and down is definitely going to be a little bit more helpful to you. It never fails when you're going to the hospital or having a procedure. It's just human nature, I think, to want to help. And so you'll have people asking what they can do for you. Tell them to prepare a meal. Tell them to bring over dinner or put some casseroles in your freezer. You're not going to feel like cooking. Your coach is going to be exhausted as well. Having some preparation for that is really, really important. If you have pets, you're going to need someone to help take care of those. Make a plan. If they're indoor pets, maybe make a plan to have them outside for a while. Get help with housekeeping or clean house before surgery and don't worry about it for a while after. And you'll also need some help going to therapy, driving to appointments and things like that. You won't be driving for at least a couple weeks. And then be sure to obtain all the equipment that you need. So a walker is a must. You must have a two-wheeled rolling walker. We actually want you to bring that to the hospital the day of surgery. So you'll need that ahead of time. Go ahead and get your name on that. Pain. Most um, patients will transition to a cane. Sometimes a knee is on a walker a little bit longer and then they transition to nothing. Hips, for sure, a cane. Shower chairs, if you have you know, a walk-in shower and it doesn't have a bench or a chair in it, you definitely want to obtain something along those lines. We want you seated in the shower for the first couple weeks. Raised toilet seats, bedside commodes, and we'll get into a little bit of that. But the big thing is just obtaining that equipment ahead of time. So before your surgery, and these are found, this information is found on page 12 to 14 of your guidebook. I can tell you, depending on when your guidebook was printed, some of this has changed. So you may want to jot some notes down here. The biggest thing on this page is to understand that five days prior to your surgery, so get your surgery date in your head, and then five days prior to your surgery, you want to stop all over the counter medications and supplements. So that means vitamins, that means any kind of herbal supplements that you take, anything that was not prescribed to you by your physician that you have to go to the pharmacy and have filled, you're going to go ahead and stop those five days prior to surgery. Now you can still take Tylenol and you can still take allergy medications and use like nasal sprays during allergy season, but real important to stop anything else. Now, if it's prescriptions, you're going to continue to take those until the anesthesia nurse tells you differently. 
So just over-the-counter medications. If you have not completed dental work or you still have a dentist appointment, I'm going to ask that you go ahead and postpone that at this point. We really want dental work finished about six to eight weeks prior to your surgery date. And then you can't go back to the dentist for three months after surgery. If you're a smoker, we ask that you really work on trying to stop, find ways to stop smoking. Smoking decreases um, your body's ability to heal. It slows that healing process. So it's real important that we can try to um, heal quickly and not have things interfering with that. We ask that you continue to eat well, well balanced, a wide variety of healthy foods, and then exercise to the best of your ability, whether it's just seated exercises or um, short walks, but trying to stay active. Now the following, I'm going to need you to go and purchase. If you don't have these at home already, I'm going to have you purchase them ahead of time. I want you to get them and then leave them at home. Set them where you would set medicines, kitchen table, kitchen counter, bathroom, wherever you keep medicines, but have these available for yourself once you get back home. So we're going to want a stool softener, and that can be like a co-lace, um, a laxative, patients like Miralax, milk of magnesia, a bottle of Tylenol, whatever strength you prefer, a bottle of aspirin, and that's coated 325 aspirin, and then an over-the-counter NSAID of your choice. And NSAIDs include Aleve, Advil, Motrin. You have Meloxicam or Celebrex. Those are considered NSAIDs. So you're going to get those few items and have them at home. This is going to be your pain protocol, your blood thinner, and your stool softener um, laxative for bowel movements. I did have a patient call me and specifically wanted me to tell every patient that cherry flavored milk of magnesia worked great for her. So I do pass that information along. If you've never taken a stool softener, it may be something you want to consider trying a few days before surgery to see how your body responds. And then please remember, you cannot under any circumstance obtain a pain medication prescription prior to surgery. You have to have the surgery. We have to determine which medication works best for you and we will take care of getting that to you prior to you leaving the hospital. So right now just purchase those over-the-counter medications for me. You will have a meeting with the anesthesia nurse if you haven't already and so we try to set those up as a face-to-face. -face. That anesthesia nurse is the one that clears you for surgery so that is definitely an important meeting that you have. They will go through instructions on which medications of your prescription medications that you can take, which ones you shouldn't be taking, which ones you take the morning of surgery. They're also the ones that give you your surgery time, tell you your arrival time. If you have any questions after you've met with them or you have any kind of concern along that area, their number is there on the screen and that number is 830-990-7919. Packing. We're getting ready to come to the hospital. That is also very important. I'm happy to tell you that we treat restore patients as they are in the hospital just for a wellness visit. You are only in that hospital gown for surgery. After that, you are in comfortable clothing. Our length of stay right now is about 1.5 days. So most of our patients are having surgery one day and they're going home the next afternoon. That being said, I do like patients to be prepared. So if you would pack for about a three-day stay, I promise you won't be there that long, but have a little bit of extra things happen. Spills occur, so just make sure that you're prepared so your poor coach isn't running all over the place to get new clothing or undergarments. We ask that you pack loose-fitting, comfortable clothes. Short sleeve shirts are preferred because of your IV. You will definitely have some t-shirts. You can bring a sweater or jacket. It is a little cool in the hospital, but definitely if you can have short sleeves on so we can access IV ports. Your guidebook, your walker, CPAP or BiPAP if you use that. Some patients will just sleep in their comfy shorts and t-shirts. Others prefer to change into pajamas. That's completely up to you. 
underwear. You will be able to put on your own underwear and undergarments. Any kind of personal grooming items, toiletries that you prefer. You'll have your own shower in your room so you can bring your own shampoos and things like that. We ask that you wear in a pair of comfortable walking shoes with a closed back because you will be in non-skid socks while you're at the hospital, but then you can wear those shoes back home. Please bring reading material, tablets, and any other devices to occupy some of your free time. We do have free Wi-Fi available to patients and coaches. All we ask, please do not bring medications, valuables, cash, and jewelry. Skin preparation before surgery. So at the doctor's office, you should have received your Start Clean kit. That's that kit that has that bottle of gel in it and then three sponges. This information is found on page 15 of your guidebook. So what you're going to do is two days before surgery, so go ahead and get that surgery date in your head again and subtract two. Two days before surgery, you're going to put fresh new sheets on your bed. You'll get out a fresh clean bath towel, clean clothes, clean undergarments. And at any point of the day, two days before surgery, you can take your first chlorhexidine shower. The process with that is you'll get in the shower, You'll take your shower as normal. You can use your body washes, shampoos, conditioners. Um, all we ask is that you don't shave at this time. We don't want any nicks or cuts. Those can actually cancel your surgery. But get in, take your regular shower, and then just be sure you rinse thoroughly. Get all of those soap suds off. Make sure that everything's out of your hair. Then you're going to transition to your first sponge and a third of the gel in that bottle. If you've never used chlorhexidine gel before, I can promise you, you're going to have bubbles for days. It is a very, very sudsy soap. It's also a very drying soap. You'll put a third of that gel onto the sponge, and then you're going to go to your surgical site. So if you're a left knee, you're going to start there. If you're a right hip, you'll start there. You're going to scrub that area for two minutes. So we ask coaches, maybe set a timer, patients sing a song, scrub that area nice and thoroughly for two minutes, and then go ahead and clean the rest of your body with that sponge. Just avoid your face and your private areas. You'll rinse your body thoroughly, dry off with a clean, fresh towel, and then avoid using any lotions or creams. You can use deodorant, but do not put on lotion or anything like that onto your skin. The day before your surgery, you'll take your second chlorhexidine shower. Again, that shower can be taken at any point of the day. There's no rule with that. Just take that, put on your clean clothing. You don't need to change your bedding again. Fresh clean towel would be ideal. You're going to remove any nail polish from fingers or toes and then get some rest. I have patients tell me all the time, oh, I'm so exhausted. I stayed up late trying to get things finished. Get some sleep. You can wait. You're not going to get a lot of sleep in the hospital. So we really, really want you to come to surgery rested. Takes us to the day of surgery. So the day of surgery, you're going to take that third and final chlorhexidine shower this is the only time I do have a rule. Um, you need to take it that morning prior to your arrival to Hill Country Memorial. If you are a arrive at the hospital at 5 a.m. surgery, you're taking a very, very early shower. So you'll arrive at the hospital. You're not you're only going to take medications that that pre-op anesthesia nurse told you to take. Do not under any means chew gum candy, use mints or throat lozenges, those things can actually cancel your surgery because of the increased acidity in your stomach with anesthesia. If you have advanced directives, please bring those with you to the hospital. This is a little different. This is what people start to look at me a little strange when I'm teaching this in front of them. So on your way to the hospital, you know, you're not going to have eaten or drank anything after midnight. But I do want you to consume 8 to 12 ounces of water on your way to the hospital. Now, no coffee, tea, or milk, or anything. I mean water. Plain Jane water. Not sparkling, not flavored, just water. 8 to 12 ounces. Now, once you arrive at Hill Country Memorial, no more. To go ahead and leave it in the car, throw it in the trash. But you'll arrive at your assigned time. You'll check in at the admissions entrance. You'll be escorted up to the Restore unit, which is on 2 South. You and your family, your coach, will be directed to your assigned room. We pre-assign those rooms the week before. 
their private rooms. And so you'll have that room to yourself. Your surgeon, the anesthesia team, the nurses, everybody knows that that's your room. And so that's where they're going to look for you and they're going to look for your family. So we do prep for surgery now in the patient's room. And so that is something that patients have really started to enjoy. They feel like they're more at home. So you and your family will be in that private room. You'll meet your pre-op nurse. You'll get changed into that hospital gown. And just in case you weren't clean enough, we're going to wipe you down with some CHG cloths one more time. Your nurse is going to start your IV. You'll get a round of IV antibiotics as well as an oral pain medication cocktail. And a scopolamine patch, which is just hospital-grade Dramamine, will be placed behind your ear to reduce your risk of nausea and vomiting after surgery. Pictures of what your room looks like. Cheery rooms, you'll have your own TV, your own bathroom. There is a couch in that room. That couch does fold out into a bed. So coaches, if you wish to stay with your patient, you are more than welcome. We never ask family to leave, but I will tell you, we don't do a lot of sleeping in the hospital. So if your patient is doing well and you feel comfortable, it's recommended that you probably go home for the night. That's a little view into what that room is going to look like. Once it's time for your anesthesia, at that point, that is when you'll tell your family member goodbye. So then you'll be rolled into the pre-op holding area. This is where the anesthesiologist will meet with you and they'll prepare you for your blocks. You'll get your operative leg marked. Um, You'll get a compression cuff um, to your non-operative side. This is just a cuff that circulates your blood. Um, You're going to be laying flat at this point, so we want to keep that circulation going. Meet with the anesthesiologist. He or she is going to review your medication history. They'll discuss nausea and pain management concerns. So for total hips, total hips get a general anesthetic and a spinal. So general means that you are put all the way under. That is the tube that's breathing for you. And then the spinal is the block from your waist down to numb your legs. And so we do that because of doing the anterior approach. We find that patients are more relaxed that way and the surgeon can really get in there to do that approach with a little more ease. For total knees, we do a spinal, so numbing from the waist down, as well as an adductor canal block. Adductor canal block is a block inserted. It's an indwelling catheter into your inner thigh. Um, That helps to control the pain to the top of the knee. Most of the time, knees, eyebrows raise at this point because I didn't say that we put you all the way under. We will give you some propofol to keep you comfortable and So you don't remember anything going on, but you're still able to maintain your own breathing, um, not put all the way under. You'll tend to wake up a little bit faster um, and a little smoother than the general anesthetic. This slide, this is for the total knees. So this is the Nimbus pain pump. This is that adductor canal block. What it does is through ultrasound, it is inserted into the inner thigh. There's a triangle in that inner thigh that houses the femoral nerve, the femoral artery, and the femoral vein. We place that catheter into that triangle, not touching any of those nerve, artery, or vein, but rather it gives us the ability to flood that nerve with marcaine. So marcaine is the same numbing medication used in dental procedures. This numbs that nerve, but it's not a pain medication. It's not an opioid. You can't overdose on Marcaine. And the pump itself is set on a controlled flow. You have ability to push the bolus button if you need it, but you can't overdose yourself. So the catheter is placed in pre-op. And then once you come out and you're given a bolus of the Marcaine before surgery, and then once you come out of surgery... They hook up the pump itself with an IV bag of the Marcaine that is then delayed for eight hours because you'll still have that spinal working for you. And then in eight hours, that pain pump turns on and it gives you a continuous flow of Marcaine for about three to five days. We're finding with that delay now, it's lasting a little bit longer. 
patients enjoy it. They're able to take it home. They feel like they have some control of their pain. And then once you're here, we'll talk about it in more detail as far as the functions and also removing it once you get home. This is what the operating room looks like. Your surgery will last about an hour to an hour and a half, and that's for hips and knees both. After surgery, you'll be taken to the recovery room or the PACU is how we refer to it. That is a one to two hour stay while you wake up. And so in PACU, your vital signs are monitored. You'll be offered juice and crackers if you are a total knee. Hips, once you kind of start waking up, we can offer ice chips, but we really have to make sure that everything is working. You have all your tummy sounds again before we can offer food. Your other compression cuff is then placed on your surgical legs. So now both those cuffs are working alternating compressing of the legs to keep the blood pumping. And you'll also have an ice pack applied to your operative side. After surgery, you're gonna experience concentrated team effort to manage your pain so that you can eat, sleep, and be mobile. We really, really want you to be up and active as quickly as possible. So you're gonna have a heart monitor on. A physical therapist will come in to evaluate you and assist you with walking once your anesthesia is worn off. And again, that's about three hours. The physical therapy team has already left for the day. We have trained all the nurses to get you up. And so the goal of Restore is that 100% of our patients are up day of surgery. That's really important to us and it's important to you and your recovery. So once you feel like you're awake and you can move things, if you feel like maybe you're ready to be checked to see if you can get out of bed, then coaches and patients, I encourage you, please push your call lights. Ask to go ahead and try to get up. It's really important that you're up that same day. You're going to have an ice pack and you're going to have those compression cuffs um, and hips. You will have a wedge pillow between your legs. That's only there until all of your feeling comes back. And once you've gotten out of bed, then it's up to you whether it goes back or not. Um, it's really just to keep you from crossing your legs while you're still sleepy. How you recover. I think I, my biggest complaint that I get from patients when I do my rounds is they say, you guys are just in and out of my room constantly. And yes, that is true. We are, but there are reasons we're in and out of your room constantly. And it's because we are taking care of you and we're ensuring that you're recovering from your surgery right on target. So some of those things that are going to be happening is called hourly rounding. So hourly rounding is done by the nurse or the care tech, and that is allowing them to check on you and you to get things that you need at that point. So it allows for toileting, it allows for refilling of water cups, just checking if you need pillows or blankets or if, if there's anything that you would need. They're going to be taking your vitals frequently. So the first 30, they're going to take them every 30 minutes for the first hour, and then every hour for the next two, followed by every four hours until you leave the hospital. Neurovascular assessments, these are to check blood flow and sensation to the surgical extremity. Those are done every two hours, followed by every six hours, and then every shift. And so what they're going to do here is they're going to feel for pulses in your feet. They're going to check for circulation in your toes. So very important there as well. And then pain is assessed every four hours. And so we do those things, vitals or something that's body checking your temperature, your pulse, your respiratory rate, and your blood pressure. Those things tell us if there's something else going on that we need to know. So a lot of times a patient can look at us and say, oh, I'm fine. I'm not hurting. Well, their blood pressure's through the roof and their pulse is high. Mm, they may be having some pain and just not telling us and we don't want it to get out of control. So we really do need to be looking into those things. So bear with us. We are just taking care of you. These are the hip precautions. Total knees, you have no precautions. I always tell my knees, all I ask is that you please don't fall down. For the total hips, however, you do have some precautions. These are there until your surgeon tells you differently. And so for an anterior, you're going to no twisting on the surgical leg, no large steps backwards. That would be called hyperextension. So we want you, if you're backing up, we want you to back up with your non-surgical leg first and then no crossing your legs. For those lateral hips, no twisting. Those are the ones who can't sit lower than 90 degrees. So no low couches or chairs 
and then no crossing of the legs. Management. So this is something that most patients really want to know about and how are we doing it? You're going to have scheduled oral pain medications. Those scheduled pain medications are over the counter. So we're scheduling Motrin and Tylenol unless for some reason you can't have one or the other of those. So what's going to happen is every four hours, you'll be given an over-the-counter pain medication. It'll be, you know, Tylenol at nine, Motrin at one, Tylenol at four. And so they will just keep rotating through giving you those. Then you will also have narcotic pain medication, which is prescription pain medication. And that will be available to you every four to six hours as needed. The only difference there is it's as needed. It's not scheduled, so you're not automatically getting it every four hours. So if you're having some increased pain, then you'll need to ask for your pain pills. And so that's something I can't stress enough is for patients to understand we only schedule over the counter. If you need something extra, you need to have that discussion with your nurse to take that oxycodone is usually what we use for your narcotic pain medication. For the first 24 hours, you'll also have IV anti-inflammatory medication. And then we do offer stool softeners and laxatives because all pain medications can cause constipation. Additional comfort measures. So there is other ways to control pain besides for just pain medication. Some of those include elevation. And so elevation is laying flat in bed, getting the foot up above the level of the chest, reducing swelling, sitting in the recliner with your feet up, changing positions often. So, you know, sit with your feet down, sit with your feet up, get in bed, get out of bed, getting up and walking, moving around. So if you've been sitting for more than two hours, you need to push your call light and you need to ask to get up. So the long periods of time being still um, can actually increase your pain. Cold therapy, we use gel ice packs. They freeze in two hours and thaw in two hours. They're completely safe to use 24 hours a day. So coaches, that's one of those things. Please feel free. There's a freezer in every patient's room. Please feel free to change those ice packs frequently for the patient. Ice really does provide some decreased pain. It also helps with some of the inflammation and swelling. So we encourage those ice packs. The pain scale. Not a single person likes it. Also, very few people understand it. So I'm going to try to explain it to you the best I can. You're going to be asked to rate your pain on the pain scale every four hours. Our expectation is that patients remain at about a three to four. So what does that mean exactly? So zero is no pain. We've had patients report no pain. It is possible. It's not reality. Don't come having your joint replaced expecting to be in no pain. There are no promises there. We expect you to hurt. We expect your pain to get worse and to get better. Four, a three to four is I'm comfortable. So I know I've had surgery, but I can still carry on a conversation with the people in my room. Greater than four, that's when you start having difficulty sleeping. Maybe you can't walk as well. You can't carry on a conversation. You've read the same line in a book a million times. So when you start hitting seven, eight, we really need to work hard with the nurse and trying to get your pain controlled. 10 out of 10, that is the worst pain you've ever had in your entire life. You're crying, you're miserable. Most patients would rather be dead than to have 10 out of 10 pain. What I'll tell you here is that when you're sitting in the chair or you're lying in bed, your pain should be less than four. That's kind of the expectation. Now, when therapy walks in the door, you've gone to group therapy class, that's a little different. Your pain should increase when you're walking. Your pain should increase when you're exercising. For it to get to a seven or eight, that's probably normal. But 15, 20 minutes after that has occurred, once you're sitting and resting again, it should go back down to a four or less. Now, if that's the case, your pain is actually perfectly controlled. So when you're rating your pain, we really want to rate it based on resting, 
not based on activity. If we're basing it off activity, we're going to overdose. We're going to take too much pain medication. Coaches, when you're asking them even at home after they get back from the hospital, be sure to ask them their pain at rest. Really, you can ask what it is um, during exercise, but that 15 to 20 minutes later is when it's really important. Where are we at when we're resting? Things that we do to prevent complications. So blood clots, pulmonary embolus, Nobody wants them. I can tell you it's a scary thing. Even think that that could happen. So we're doing everything we can to prevent it. We're doing ankle pumps. We got you up day of surgery. So early ambulation. We're using those compression cuffs on your legs. We're taking a 325 aspirin once a day and we're doing that for 30 days unless it's contraindicated for you. If you take prescription blood thinners, then your protocol is going to be a little bit different than everybody else. But for the most, uh, most of our patients, it's a 325 coated aspirin once a day for 30 days. Pneumonia, that's another complication that can occur after a surgery. I can tell you we don't see much pneumonia because you're up and moving so quickly. Your nurses are going to encourage 10 deep breaths with a heavy cough every hour. Those go along with the ankle pumps that you'll be doing every hour. If you have a history of kind of lung disease or history of pneumonias, you may be given an incentive spirometer by the respiratory therapy team. Infections. We are doing everything we can to prevent infections. So we are monitoring your vital signs frequently. We are looking in and around the incision. We've given you antibiotics. And I promise you, if we don't like it, your surgeon is the first to find out. Hand washing. So this is something that I sat in my office watching our staff going in and out of rooms and I'm watching them use the hand sanitizer going in and use the hand sanitizer going out. Well, then I would watch family members come to visit. They were coming from HEB. They were coming from church. Grandkids were coming from school and they're coming in and they're hugging and kissing on grandma or grandpa and they weren't washing their hands. And so it got me thinking, why as staff, you know, we, we're required to do that, but why aren't we asking our visitors to do that? So coaches, that's another thing I'm asking from you. Please use the hand sanitizers in the room before you go in or they're right outside the room. And then if you have visitors, please ask them, hey, do you mind using that hand sanitizer before you come touch us? Um, and then ask them to use it upon leaving. So we really do want to prevent um, any kind of spread of germs, since getting catching something else from their visitors, that would be terrible. So please pass it on and, and use it every time you enter um, your loved one's room. Nausea and vomiting, we have medications ordered to control those things. We don't want you to be nauseated. We don't want you vomiting. And so if you have those problems, we will also make sure that we send you home with something to control that as well. Constipation, we have medications, the stool softeners, the laxatives, we talk about hydration, frequent mobility, there's high fiber foods, so all of those things are important. And folks, uh, constipation is no joke, it will happen, so please stay on top of it, please be very aware of when your last bowel movement was. Coaches, don't be afraid to ask if they've had a bowel movement really, really important that we stay on top of that. What we don't want is to have a small bowel obstruction. This is what you're going to look like the day after surgery. You're going to have your heart monitor. You're going to have your pain pump if you're a total knee. You'll be up and moving on your walker. You're going to walk with physical therapy twice a day. They walk you in the morning and in the afternoon. You'll also start your group therapy classes. Those are at 10 and 2 every day. You'll be on a regular diet. You'll be out of bed. We'll start taking some of these monitors off of you. If you're a Dr. Ramonic patient, we'll remove your wound drains and we will unwrap the ACE wraps from your legs the day after surgery. Incision care. So this is another part of preventing infection. Your incision is actually covered and not messed with. We put the bandage on the incision in the operating room when you're the most sterile. We use two types of dressings to prevent infection. 
And so the one in the top there, that is an aquacell dressing. And then one in the bottom of the screen, that is a jumpstart dressing. So the jumpstart dressing, that one goes directly over the incision. And then it is covered by that aquacell dressing. That aquacell dressing stays on for seven days um, once you leave the hospital. And then it can be changed on day seven by either home health or we will teach your coach how to change that dressing. The Aquacell dressing is waterproof, so you are able to take a shower the day after surgery and every day after that if you would like. The hospital will supply you with these extra dressings as well as a wound cleansing solution, so you don't have to worry about going out and buying anything there. We will definitely send those home with you. The biggest thing is to make sure that the dressing remains intact, that there's no excessive drainage on that dressing. Other than that, it's just one dressing change at day seven, and then at day 14, your surgeon will remove it when you're in the office seeing him. So physical therapy, this is what it looks like for your group therapy classes. You'll be in your recliners, sitting side by side, whiteboards under your legs, blue straps, colorful balls, and that class will happen every day at 10 and at 2, starting the day after surgery. Physical therapy will work on helping you get in and out of bed, get in and out of a chair. They're going to continue to increase your walking distance. The goal to go home is 250 feet or more. If you have stairs, they do a stair review and let you practice going up and down stairs. And then car transfers are taken care of as you discharge from the hospital. Occupational therapy, there are our occupational therapists. Their job is to make sure that you can safely do daily living tasks. So things such as taking a shower, getting on and off the toilet, getting dressed, putting on your socks, shaving, brushing your teeth, doing your hair, doing all of those things safely without falling over so that you are independent at home. So they use some things, assistive devices. So they're holding right there a reacher, which is in Brooke's hand, the one on the left, and then a sock aid in Wendy's hand on the right. And so those are just some of the devices as well as like a long handled sponge or a shoehorn uh, to help get those swollen feet into those shoes. And so those are options of things that you can buy ahead of time. They're not covered by insurance, so it is an out-of-pocket expense. You can buy it actually in a kit together, all four of those items, the reacher, the sockade, the sponge, and the shoehorn. They can be purchased off Amazon at any kind of local medical supply store, um, but definitely some items that may be helpful to you in your recovery. Again, that rolling walker, that is the one required piece of equipment. We have to have that. Two wheels in the front, peg legs in the back. Be sure to get your name on that walker. The other picture there is a bedside commode. Very important and helpful tool to you. We don't want you using it, of course, as a commode. We're hoping you're walking well enough that you're using your own restroom at home. But definitely helpful in rising the seat of your toilet, having a little toilet razor there. So you can remove the bucket, increase the legs, and put it over your pre-existing toilet. It gives you the handles on the sides, and then it can be adjusted in height so that you're not sitting quite as low. That bedside commode can also be used as a chair in the shower. Again, adjust the height so it's comfortable. Set it in your shower. You've got your handles there. You've got the seat to sit on and you can take your shower seated. You can also buy just a raised toilet seat if your toilet is too low. Handheld shower heads are helpful. The bathroom safety bars or grip bars. That hip kit that we talked about, which includes that long-handled sponge, reacher, long-handled shoehorn, and that sock aid. So talking about rehab, we talked about how nobody really leaves the hospital without a rehab plan. And so here are some of your options. Like I said, about 85 to 90% of our patients use home health care. So home health care is great for several reasons. So home health care once you've discharged from the hospital, they send out a nurse the next day. That nurse assesses you head to toe, goes through your medications with you, checks your dressing, makes sure you have everything you need. 
you also get the therapies with home care. So you'll get physical therapy and then if you still would need some occupational therapy with showering or assist um, with daily living things, then you would get occupational therapy as well. We at Hill Country Memorial do have our own home care team. They're very versed in Restore. They've worked with us for a long time with that. They cover about 13 counties. Best way to look at it is if you start in Fredericksburg and drive one hour in any direction, have you covered. If you can't, if you're further than that and you can't use our home care, our case managers do know of several home care companies in all areas, so we can get that set up for you. It is the one and only thing that is 100% covered by Medicare definitely gives you the ability to be at home, recover at home for maybe a week or so, allows you to not have to be getting in and out of the car, and then they'll be coming to visit you two to three times a week. So definitely probably the one we encourage the most, um, especially it gets you through that first dressing change. And then by two weeks out, you'll be going back to the doctor. And usually your surgeon at that point will tell you to go ahead and transition to outpatient. And so outpatient is where you're going to a therapy clinic. Um, so you would have someone drive you to their facility. You'll go there two to three times a week. And it's about a 45 minute to an hour workout session each time you go. You can go straight from the hospital to outpatient too. Like if you go home and you don't want home health, you don't you want to be more aggressive, then outpatient is definitely a good option for you. It's definitely a more aggressive therapy. It is covered by Medicare, and then your private insurances will vary on that a little bit. The last two in the in that chart are acute rehab and skilled nursing facilities. So those are for the patient who maybe doesn't have anybody at home to take care of them. For the patient who has more medical need and maybe needs to be in a rehab facility a little bit longer. So those need to be approved by insurance. Once you're approved, then the then you would go and reside there in that facility. Examples of acute rehab unit, the closest one to us is Sid Peterson Rehab. They have their acute rehab unit. And then the SNFs or skilled nursing facilities, those would be examples of those would be Wincrest, the Canops, different nursing homes. And those nursing homes all have rehab wings. And so it's set for those short stay patients who are just coming in to have the little bit of extra care, the medical care, and the rehab. And then once you progress out of those and you're doing well and you can return home, then you can actually get the home care benefits as well. So definitely some things to think of. Case management will be by as well as our home care team. If you choose home care, they'll come by and visit with you and discuss in more detail what that's going to look like. Something we want you to think about, the decision can't be made until you've had surgery. We can't really set anything up until surgery is done and the physical therapist has done that initial visit with you in the hospital. But we definitely want you to have a plan. We're going to ask for it that we can go ahead and get that set up. So once you have surgery, definitely ask what your rehab plan will be. When you're leaving the hospital, get in the front seat on the passenger side of your own vehicle. If you live more than two hours from the hospital, we ask that you stop, get out, walk around the car a little bit, or even if you become uncomfortable that you stop. No air travel for the next 30 days. You need to be cleared um, from your surgeon to go ahead and do that travel. This very last slide is just, I hope for you is that maintaining a positive attitude improves your chance of a successful outcome. And I not only say that for you, the patient, to remain positive throughout this, but that is always my hope for our staff. I hope that when you're here at Hill Country Memorial, you find that the staff loves to be here. Restore truly is a team effort. We work hard. We, I hope that you're going to find smiling faces and people who are really there to encourage you for you to have the best outcome that you can. Those pictures are just pictures of our previous patients. The lady on the horse, um, I think, has had a couple shoulders and knees replaced with us, and her goal was to get back to roping and barrel racing again, and she is doing that very successfully at this point. 
And then the gentleman has had both knees replaced with us and he just wanted to dance with his wife again. And he did. And so there is hope after joint replacement. Um, the pain will eventually go away once the joint is replaced and your ability to return to your normal life and free life will be available to you. So I hope this was helpful. Please reach out to me if you have any questions or concerns or need any follow-up with this pre-op class. So again, my name is Kelly Schneider. I am your Restore Program Coordinator at Hill Country Memorial Hospital. My email, if you want to email me questions, is kschneider, that's K-S-C-H-N-E-I-D-E-R, at hillcountrymemorial.org, or my direct line to call me is 830-990-6134. Again, that's 830-990-6134. I really hope this was helpful. Please make sure that if you need more information, you reach out or you can watch the video again. Again, this is a required part of your pre-op process in order to have your joint replacement surgery. I'll see you soon. I hope you are doing well and we'll see you on surgery day. Thank you.